Jesus. Favorites, like, I don't like Jesus having favorites. 
Just like I don't like the teacher having favorite or the parent having favorite. But Jesus did have an inner circle. Jesus does seem to have three of the disciples that he pulls a little bit closer to him. He keeps these guys a little bit closer to him. He allows these guys to see some things that he doesn't allow everybody else to see. He seems to pour into these guys a little bit more. It's actually a really effective leadership style to focus in on a few key. And I take, for instance, Hux. There's hundreds of students. More than that, if you think about everybody that comes to a live week in, week out. And Hux can invest in every single one of those 100, 150 people equally. There's not enough time. And there's not enough Hucks. And Hucks can enable other people and, and small group leaders and Sunday school teachers and whatever. But sometimes somebody like Hucks or sometimes somebody like Will Snipes has to say, let me pull a few of these guys, keep them a little bit closer, spend a little more time with them, and let them in turn have solid, strong leadership and begin to make a difference in other people's lives. And it seems like that's what Jesus does for Peter, James, and John. I'm going to tell you real quick, Two other times where Jesus pulls Peter, James, and John a little bit closer and lets them see something that not everybody else gets to see. One day there's a guy named Jairus. Jairus has a daughter. Jairus' daughter is sick. Jairus' daughter is dying. They sin for Jesus. Miracles. They go over there, and when they get there, they say to Jesus, um, you're awesome, we love you. We believe you're the Son of God. You're also late, all right? Jairus' daughter has already died. She's in the next room. She's dead. Anybody know what Jesus says? She's not dead. She's, she's only sleeping. And they say, Jesus, you know, this may be Bible times, but she's dead. All right, we checked her pulse. We understand these things scientifically. She's dead. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John into the room with him. Only Peter, James, and John. He takes them into the room. She sits up. She's alive. He sees these three guys see Jesus, bring her back to life. And then Jesus does one of my favorite things that he does. He says, see, you know, she's not dead. She's just alive. And then he says, somebody get her something. It's like she's had a rough day, okay? It's been hard being dead and brought back to life. Get her, you know, some Cheetos or something. If you remember when Jesus took some disciples up on the mountain with him to pray right before the crucifixion events began to happen, he takes three guys up on the mountain with him, and this is not a real good night for them because they're the ones that keep falling asleep. And Jesus goes on to pray, and he comes back, and they're sleeping. And he wakes them up, and I'm like, we're so sorry, we're supposed to be praying, something big's about to happen. Jesus, they come back, it's back, they're sleeping again. It's Peter, James, and John. Tonight, Eli, Mark chapter 9. Jesus invites Peter, James, and John on a hiking trip. They're at the mountain. They're not at the beach. They're at the mountain. He calls up Peter, James, and John. He says, guys, we're going up on the mountain. We're going hiking. Get your analogy. Get your chocos. Do whatever. We're headed out. Peter, James, and John. Just those three. Hunter, there's a couple of reasons why experts believe. Kind of interesting. Why Peter, James, and John? What sets them apart? What makes them special? Why are they pulled in to kind of the inner circle with Jesus? Here's a couple of things you can think about. Of the disciples, Peter was the oldest. John was the youngest. And so some experts think Jesus is kind of saying, let me get like the range of ages here. Let me get the oldest guy, let me get the youngest guy, kind of get a lot of different age type things in there. It's interesting also, if you look at these guys, after Jesus is, is, is crucified and, and resurrected and appears, as the pastor talked about this morning, 40 days, 500 people ascends back into heaven, James will live only in a very short time. James is one of the first disciples to give his life. John will live for seven decades. John will live for 70 more years. So maybe even when Jesus pulled these guys in a little bit closer, he's like, I'm going to get the youngest and the oldest. I'm going to get the one that's going to check out pretty quickly. I'm going to get the one that's going to live for 70 years before he lays his life down. Tonight, 
Tonight they're going hiking with Jesus of Mount Hermon. Let me tell you one more thing. Jesus has just previous to this hike predicted his own death. It's the first time, Cohen, that Jesus has talked about his death. It's the first time that Jesus has said to his disciples, guys, I'm going to I'm going to give a life up. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here for long. You know what they said? No, no, don't say that. Don't say that. We don't like it when you say that. We like having you around. You're really nice. And you do miracles and stuff. Jesus had just predicted his own death. And we believe that Jesus went up on that mountain that day to pray to the Father, to be close to the Father, to pray for strength, because Jesus now knows this thing is heading towards his crucifixion. But can then he takes Peter, James, and John with him? Let's read. Uh, one more thing. Anybody know what transfiguration means? Hey, it's transfiguration. Go. Thank you. Transfiguration. Transfiguration is to completely change appearance, all right? So if something is transfigured right in front of your eyes, it changes appearance completely. And that's what Jesus is going to do up on Mount Hermon. And then Mark chapter 9, verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched... Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. It's one of those stories that jumps right into the action from the very beginning. You don't have to wait long to get there. They go up on the mountain to be alone, to be closer to the Father, right? And Jesus, they're standing there, Peter, James, and John. They're like, this is awesome. We get to spend time with Jesus. We love him so much. He's standing there in his appearance, completely transformed in front of them. And he became dazzling white. Baseball players, you know that stuff your, your mama buys and washes your pants to try to make them white? You know what I'm talking about? Dazzling white. So I wanted to show you guys a picture of this event. And this is true, Hux. Today, at some point in time, I used a Google image, Transfiguration of Christ. I found some paintings. I found some pictures. But I didn't like any of them because they weren't like what I think this must have looked like. They, looked, they were artists' ideas, and that's fine. And they all painted. And Jesus is dazzling white. And there's Moses and Elijah. We're about to talk about them. And there's James and Peter and John standing in front of them. But I didn't like not one of those pictures. So tonight, I want you to think about it in What must it have looked like? Dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Let me tell you something about Peter. The more you study scripture, you'll see that Peter is a lot like a lot of us. He speaks a lot of times without thinking. Do you do that? Do you say something sometimes and you're like, oh, wish I had said that. Peter's pretty bad about doing that. Peter speaks right up. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Peter speaks up, and basically what Peter is saying is this, I just want to stay right here. I'm scared, but this is incredible. I see Moses and Elijah, who are two of my top heroes from the Old Testament. I see Jesus like I've never seen them before, dazzling white. Let's build some shelters. Let's build some booths. Let's stay up here. I'm saying all this because I don't really know what else to say because I'm terrified. That's Peter. Let me tell you a, a word about this dazzling white that they were seeing in Jesus in that moment. Listen to this closely. They were seeing just a tiny little bit of Griffin of his glory. And I read this somewhere and I love this. Listen to this closely. I read this. See, Jesus, remember this. We were talking about this at some point in time when I've been talking to some people on this trip. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He's fully God. He's fully man. He's not half and half. If your brain can't understand that, it's not supposed to. 
Keith's brain can't understand that. No one in here is Keith. He's not 50-50, he's not 60-40, all right? He's 100% man and 100% God. But, up until this point, listen to this closely, his humanity, his humanness, has largely concealed his identity, his godness. His godness is not showing through for the first 30 years of his life as far as we know. He's not walking down the street and people are like, whoa! And there's like a glow coming off of him. Me, 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 me. And people, you know, the kids sit next to him in school, like feeling the presence of God. No. It seems that for the first 30 years of his life, and even beginning here, he's starting to do some miracles and things in his ministry. But his humanity is kind of veiling or covering up his godness, right? He's still 100% God and 100% man. This is the way it was explained in something that I read and I loved it. I want you to picture a tent. If I brought a tent up here and set a tent up on the stage, most of you guys know what a tent looks like. And you open the flap of the tent, and then you just barely peek inside. All right? Can you see that? I read somewhere that Jesus' humanity has largely concealed his identity, and now the flap on the tent is lifted just a little. Like, like Peter, James, and John have lifted the flap and they have seen just a peak of his glory. What do you think would have happened if they had seen him in his full glory? Heads fall off, blinded? I don't know. I don't think they could handle it. Jesus shows them this is about this much of his glory. He becomes dazzling white. His appearance changes right in front of them, whiter than anything they've ever seen on this earth. There's light around him, I believe. Moses and Elijah, we still got to talk about them. They are seeing like this much of his glory. Three lucky guys. Why Moses and Elijah? You're going to love this. Moses and Elijah to the Jewish people in this time in the New Testament. The, to the Jewish people, Moses and Elijah are the two. They're the two favorites. They love Moses and Elijah. They are crazy about Moses and Elijah. Moses represents, and you may see this up on the screen, Moses represents the law. Anybody know why Moses represents the law? Because he did what? He brought those Ten Commandments down back. So any time that you see Moses, especially when Moses is mentioned in the New Testament, Moses always represents the law. And the Jewish people were all about the law, and the Pharisees were all about the law. And I'm going to explain something right here, and I want you to make a note of this, because I went and looked it up for you. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Write that down. Romans 3, 19 and 20. I'm going to touch on this barely because it's a difficult concept, but you can talk about it later or in your small group leaders. Why? This question was given to the small group leaders. Why was the law put into place? Anybody know the answer to that? The law. Those Ten Commandments, the things that we do, the things that we don't do. Why was the law put into place? You can look it up later in Romans 3, 19 and 20. This is going to be tricky. Listen, the law was put into place so that we could realize we can never meet its requirements. That's deep. The law was put into place, Eli, to give us this standard to help us realize that's a standard we can never meet. We will never be able to get to God on our own. We'll never be able to follow all the requirements of the law. And that's why it's there to show us that we're always going to fall short. Does that make sense? Kind of. It's deep. You can walk into any church on a Sunday morning. The majority of people in the church will not be able to answer that question or explain that to you. Let's see how you guys are doing with the requirements of the law. Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie. If your hand's not up right now, you're lying. So welcome to the club. <laughs> Every single one of you right now is saying, Hazel, is your hand up? Thank you. 
Every single one of you is saying right now, I have not met the requirements of the law because Joe, the law says what? Thou shalt not lie. Let's go King James for it. <laughs> so every single one of us has just raised our hand, adults, all of us. We have not met the requirements of the law. And whether you have lied one time or you have lied a thousand times or you've lied 10,000 times, you have not met the requirement of the law because the law says what? Don't. So the law is put into place, Brian, to show me I can't, I can't, I can't do it. There is this standard that God has put into place. He is a perfect, holy, just, righteous God, and I can't meet that standard because the standard says, "Don't lie." I told him. How many people have not honored their mother and father in some way? Delayed reaction, but we got there. <laughs> you don't meet the requirements of the law. I don't meet the requirements of the law. That's why the law is there. Moses represents the law. You ready for this? Are you ready for this? What did Jesus do with the law? You may not know the word I'm going for here. I didn't phrase my question very well. Not one of us in here could ever fulfill the requirements of the law. We could never meet the requirements of the law. What did Jesus do with the requirements of the law? He fulfilled every one of them. He met every one of them. Get it? Don't lie. Jesus like Chet. Honor your mother and father. He's like Mary and Joseph. But, <laughs> don't kill. Jesus like, are you kidding me, Chet? <laughs> don't steal. Never even thought about it. But <laughs> adultery, mm, don't even know what that means. Check. <laughs> so Jesus is like, you know, some adultery is bad. All right, so Jesus meets the requirements. He meets, he fulfills the requirements of the law. When you see Moses and you see those Old Testament, the man, the Jewish people, they love Moses. I got to tell you this. They come to Jesus. Y'all remember when Moses was leading the people and the man came down? Y'all remember that? The man and the bread came down from heaven, right? John chapter 6, go read it for yourself. They're talking. Jesus just fed the 5,000, so the topic of the day is bread, right? And, and, and the people say to Jesus, Camden, I can't believe they said this to Jesus. They say, why don't you do something cool like Moses, huh? Why aren't you awesome like Moses? We love Moses so much. Why don't you do something like bring down bread from heaven? Because that's what Moses did. You know what Jesus says? Moses didn't bring down bread from heaven. My father did. Yeah, but him. <laughs> Jesus says, I love Moses. I'm a huge fan of Moses. I'm all about Moses. I was, I've been with Moses. I'm boys with Moses. We're tight. <laughs> this is what Jesus says. Listen, I am a new and better Moses. Because Moses brought the law down. I fulfilled the law. Moses showed us that standard that we can never meet. I met it. Isn't that awesome? Don't you love studying God's word? Let's talk about Elijah. Anytime that you see Elijah, Elijah represents the prophets. Thank you. Perfect time. Elijah represents the prophets. Why Moses and Elijah? Why that day when Jesus transfigures and shows his glory to Peter, James, and John, he's flanked on the sides, Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. What did the prophets do? The prophets brought a message, delivered a message from God. That's what prophets did, Savannah. God gave a message and the prophets voiced it, Right? The prophets talked all the time about the coming Messiah. The prophets were always talking about the one who is to come. They were always giving prophecies. Prophets give prophecies. They were always saying, this is where the Messiah is going to be born. He's going to be born in a place called Bethlehem. He's going to be born of a virgin. I know that doesn't make any sense, but it's going to happen. They made all these prophecies, right? They delivered all these messages from God. The other thing that the prophets did, they did it all the time. They said, Prepare, get ready, he's coming. Clean up your act, repent, turn.
turn from your sin. Get your life together. Stop worshiping idols. Stop running away from God because the Savior, the Messiah, the long-expected one is coming. That's what prophets do. That's what Elijah did. Jesus shows up and then what he says, I am the fulfillment of everything those prophets were talking about. You get it, don't you? Everything the prophets prophesied, all the prophecies they made, all the times they kept telling God's people, turn from your wicked ways. I'm here. And so the, 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 the Jewish people loved Moses, and they loved Elijah, and they loved the law, and they loved the prophets. And Jesus shows up and says, I'm the fulfillment of all of that. I'm the new and better Moses. I'm the new and better Elijah. <laughs> Love it. I'll tell you one more thing. I'll be finished with Moses and Elijah for a minute, then I'll be back on them because I love them so much. I'll tell you one more thing about Moses and Elijah. A lot of experts on the Bible believe that Moses and Elijah are there, and Moses and Elijah are, are right there by Jesus because Moses and Elijah both had incredible exits from this earth. Start with Elijah because you're more likely to know this. How did Elijah exit from this earth? Chariot of fire. Kind of cool, huh? The thing is burning, but it's not consumed. Swoops down, picks him up, he's out. One of my favorite things to tell people, because it is in Scripture and most people don't know it. How did Moses leave this world? Amen. Moses dies of old age. God buries Moses himself in a place that nobody knows where it is. Pretty sweet. Huh? God's like, hey, no need to call Woods Mortuary, all right? I'm taking care of my boy myself. He takes Moses somewhere and buries Moses. And to this day, we do not know where Moses is buried. You cannot go in and, and, and visit the ceremonial, we mark it with a stone, it was Bible times, but we can't do that for Moses because nobody knows where Moses is buried but God himself. That's a cool exit out of this world. And here's what some people think about Moses and Elijah and Jesus. Jesus is like, Moses, you got a cool exit out of this world. Mm. Buried by the Father. Elijah, chariot of fire. Jesus says, let me tell you about my exit out of this world. I'm going to die on the cross, <clears throat> buried in a rich man's grave, raised from the dead, appear to over 500 people 40 days, and I'm going to ascend up into heaven. You're going to watch a lot of my feet as I get back up into heaven. That's how I'm exiting out of this world. Moses and Elijah. Verse 7. Get back to the story. James and Peter and John seeing the glimpse of Jesus' glory. Moses and Elijah there, Peter speaking up. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what it meant by rising from the dead. That's the whole story of the transfiguration, friends. It appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Look at this verse specifically. A cloud overwhelmed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. God speaks in that moment. God speaks to, to Peter and James and John. They're right there. And he says, This is my son. I want you to listen to him. What he says, you listen to it. And one of the questions you're going to be asked tonight is this. What are some of the things that Jesus specifically tells us to do? Let me just throw a few your way. Jesus says you must be born again. You must be born twice. 
One to the water, and one to the spirit. One to the water is when you were born naturally to your mother. One to the spirit is when the spirit of God comes over you and you were born again a second time. God says, hey, when Jesus says something, listen to him. You must be born again. Jesus says more things than some of my guys know. We studied some of these things. We studied some of the things that Jesus tells us we must do. Jesus says, fear him who can condemn both body and soul to hell. Don't fear someone that can kill you. If somebody walks in here with a gun right now, I'm going to say, I don't fear you. Okay, a little bit. I don't fear you because all you can do is something to my body. But I fear the one who can condemn both body and soul to hell. That's what Jesus said. Listen to him. Jesus says a lot of times, be careful with your money. Be careful what you do with your money. Be careful how important your money becomes to you. Listen to him. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've told you, and inviting them to come to worship at the beach on Thursday night at 715. Listen to him. God speaks down this day and says, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Look at this next statement. The law and the prophets that we talked about so much, those things must give way to Jesus. We learn from the prophets. We learn from the things that they said, but we listen to Jesus. That's good, isn't it? The Old Testament is huge, and the more you study Scripture, the more you learn this, friends. The Old Testament is always pointing us towards Jesus. It's always pointing us towards the New Testament. It's always pointing us towards God's plan for saving His people and redeeming His people. And so the Old Testament law that we were so huge on, the prophets that we were so huge on, those give way to Jesus. We can learn from them, but we listen to Jesus. And let me toss this out there for you, and one person will take it and run with it. Somebody told me this one time, and I have not forgotten, and I don't always live by it, and I need to. They said, you should read from the Gospels every single day. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Why? Because that's when Jesus was actually here on earth. And that's when you can actually listen to what he said when he was here on earth. They said, you read your Bible, you do your devotion, you do your book, you read your proverb, you read from the Old Testament, but you should read, I should read from one of the four Gospels every single day. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I can listen to what Jesus said. That's good, isn't it? i got to tell you one more thing. And I love this. And you're going to love this. And this is, this is just interesting stuff that you need to know. And then we'll start to kind of move towards wrapping things up. You're not going to believe what I'm about to go to Revelation chapter 11. Why Revelation? Dragons? What? <laughs> Revelation chapter 11. You're going to love this. In Revelation... Find someone really wise with a lot of books about Revelation and study it. And you'll come up with lots more questions, and that's awesome. But I have to point this out to you because it's so good. There's a period of time called the Tribulation. Anybody know how long the Tribulation lasts? It lasts for seven years. It gets crazy at the three and a half year mark, right? 42 months, 1260 days, read Revelation. Friends, Jesus himself says this tribulation time will be like nothing that the world has ever experienced. And I know you're like, wait a minute, I thought we were on the mountain with Jesus hiking and then you saw his glory and now you're talking about Revelation. Stick with me. Jesus says the tribulation will be worse than anything this world has ever experienced. And this world has experienced a lot of bad things like diseases and the Black Death and the plague and the Holocaust and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus says this will be worse than anything. And during the tribulation, when the Antichrist is ruling, study Revelation, listen, there are two prophets. There are two prophets that stand in the street and continue to preach God and preach Jesus when the whole world has turned. There are two prophets that are not named. 
that there's two prophets in Revelation chapter 11. And we think that is Moses and Elijah. And I want to read you about them. <laughs> I want you to see why we think it's Moses and Elijah. And I want you to see what happens. And I want you to be astounded. And I want you to think that Moses and Elijah are the best two candidates right here. And they represent, are you ready for this? They represent God's glory during the tribulation. Because they were there when God's glory was revealed that day on that mountain to Peter, James, and John. And Peter, James, and John were changed forever because they saw God's glory. Jesus' glory. And now we think this is Moses and Elijah showing God's glory during the tribulation. Are you ready for this? Revelation 11, 4. These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Marley, who had the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Marley, who had that power? That's what we did last year at a last summer camp, remember? Do you guys know who had the power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as that person prophesied? Anybody want to take a guess? Elijah. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them and he will conquer them and kill them. Oh, no. I love Moses and Elijah. And they got killed by the beast that came up out of the bottomless pit. Their bodies will lie in the main streets of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, we're all about three and a half, for three and a half days, all peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. This is the saddest thing I've ever heard because Moses and Elijah are killed by the beast and their bodies are laying in the streets for three and a half days and everybody celebrates that they're dead and gives presents like we give presents at Christmas and birthdays. They're giving presents and celebrating because Moses and Elijah are the two prophets are dead. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. We will see the glory of God during the tribulation. And there are two prophets who will rise up after three and a half days of death and be personally invited into heaven by God who will say, come up here. We will see God's glory during the tribulation. Like it. Let me finish up. I started out tonight talking about three guys whose really lives made a difference for the kingdom of God. We focused on Peter, James, and John. And I want to tell you tonight that I think the day that they saw a glimpse of Jesus' glory on the mountain really stuck with those guys. Don't you think it would stick with you? If you were hiking with Jesus at the top of Mount Hermon and you saw him transfigured and glowing dazzling white and Moses and Elijah in the sky and the voice of God saying, this is my son, listen to him. And then Moses and Elijah disappeared, and Jesus said, let's go back down the mountain and not really tell anybody about this. And we go, mm -hmm. but I'll never forget it. Do you know how we know that they never forgot it? This is so cool. Because they wrote about it. The only one who didn't get to write about it, listen to me, the only one who didn't get to write about it was James. Because I told you James was martyred very early. James doesn't live very long, right? And so I think that James was like, i got to write down what happened on that mountain that day. But he never got to because he was martyred. But John got to write it down. Look on the screen at John 1.14. Some of you have read John 1.14 before, but now it makes sense. Look, John wrote this. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. John wrote that down. 
John said, I have seen the glory of the Father's one and only Son. I saw it that day on the mountain. I hung out with him all the time. I saw him do incredible miracles. I know how kind and gracious and loving and forgiving he was. But listen, I saw his glory. I'm writing it down. I'm writing it in the very first chapter of my book called John. Peter writes it down. Peter writes it down in 2 Peter 1, 16-18. Peter was there on the mountain that day. Peter saw the glory of Jesus that day. Here's what Peter writes. It's a little bit longer. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey guys, let me tell you the truth. We didn't make this stuff up. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. Look at this, friends. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. As he was. You read stuff like this because you're like reading 2 Peter one day because you're like, I'm trying to read my Bible. And so I'm reading 2 Peter. And you just read right over that and you don't connect it back to you that Peter was there that day at the transfiguration on the mountain. And now he's saying, hey, I'm not making up stuff. I heard the voice of God speak to him. I saw his glory. I saw honor and glory from God the Father. I peeked inside the tent. I saw him dazzling white. John wrote about it. Peter wrote about it. James never got to write about it because he was martyred very early. But here's the thing I want you to think about. Peter and James and John would do great things for the kingdom. They would lay down their lives for the kingdom. Why? Because they had seen the glory of God. It wasn't just because they're like all stars. It's not just because they're like the most incredible guys and they're just like, we're going to make a difference in this world. These guys saw the glory of God. They got a glimpse of the glory of God. And I believe it changed them. They were already following Jesus. They had already laid down everything to follow him and to be his disciples and to listen to him teach and to try to pattern their lives after him. But they were still guys that struggled a lot. But I think on this day, when they saw his glory, I think after that, they were never the same. And remember all three of these guys who would give their lives up for the kingdom of God to lay their life down back. Did you know God's calling you to lay your life down? It's like, I don't want to die. I've got to get through seventh grade first. I got some fishing to do. I got some Fortnite to play. God's calling you to lay your life down, which means to give up what you want all the time, to give up being selfish, to give up having your own agenda, to give up thinking about yourself all the time, and do those things that bring him glory and bring him honor and make his name. That's what it means to lay your life down. Take up your cross and follow him, right? These three guys did this. And let me make my most important point of the night. Listen maybe more closely than you've listened at any point in time. Listen so closely. I was sharing the story of the transfiguration. This is kind of like one of those moments, like last night, when I thought I should have told all the girls to pin their hair up, right? I was making the point, I was teaching the transfiguration sometime in the spring, and I was making this point. And then I, here's what happened. I was saying to a group of people, I wish, this is what I was saying, I wish that I could see the glory of God like Peter and James and John did that day. Because then maybe I'd be willing to lay my life to but I wasn't there that day. I wasn't on Mount Carmel that day. But I, I was saying these words. I was, I was making this point. Gosh, maybe I would be willing to do something with my life for the kingdom of God if I had seen the glory of God revealed to me like those guys got to see. And I caught myself. As soon as these words were coming out of my mouth, I caught myself. Because listen to me closely. I thought, I have seen the glory of God. I have 
I've seen the glory of God. I've seen the glory of God a lot. I, I've seen the glory of God in people in this room. I've seen the glory of God in people's lives that have been changed. I've seen the glory of God in people's testimonies of how the gospel changed them. I've seen the glory of God in the sunrise. I've seen the glory of God in the sunset. I've seen the glory of God in the miracle. I've seen the glory of God in someone's life who has lived faithfully for 90 years or 100 years. I see the glory of God in Billy Graham when I saw Billy Graham get his life up this year. And I've read about Billy Graham and I've been to the Billy Graham Library. I see the glory of God in him. I see the glory of God in students who want to make a difference in their schools and among their friends and they don't want to be just like everybody else. I see the glory of God. I saw the glory of God last night when so many people put their faces down on the carpet and said, I have so much to be thankful to the Lord for and I have so much love and gratitude for him. I saw the glory of God in this room. I see the glory of God. I hear the glory of God when I'm outside that door and I hear you guys sing it, right? I see the glory of God and the goodness of people in this world, people who have been so good to me, people who have forgiven me, people who have provided for me, people who love me. Even when I mess up, I see the glory of God. I see the glory of God in the church when the church rallies around people and supports people and loves people and helps people out. I see the glory of God in old people at church who take food to people and pray for people and give their money to I see the glory of God. I see the glory of God in missionaries. I see the glory of God in missionaries in China. I see the glory of God in missionaries in Ecuador. I see the glory of God in missionaries in Nigeria when I go to these places and these people live and they live in places I don't want to live because the hot water doesn't work and the beds are uncomfortable and the food's weird and I ate a grasshopper one time and I'm like I see these people give their lives up I see the glory of God when I go there and I was standing on a stage somewhere with a microphone like this in my hand and I was making this point that was not a point at all. I was making this point. Gosh, I wish I could see the glory of God like Peter and James and John saw the glory of God because they saw Jesus dazzling white and they got a glimpse of his glory. I wish I could see that and then I would do something.
that just very simply say, I want a life that matters in this world. I want a life like Peter, James, and John. Those guys weren't perfect. But they saw the glory of God and they were never the same. And I want a life that makes a difference like that. There are adults that would love to pray that way for you. Let me say one more thing. There's this mindset out there, and it's one of my least, listen closely, it's one of my least favorite things in this world. There's this mindset out there that God created the teenage years for you to do whatever you want to. I'm a teenager. I'm 12. I got double digits. I'm a teenager. I'm 16. I'm 17. This time is for me to do whatever I want to. So I ride around, and I go to QT, and I smash people's mailboxes, and I play Fortnite, and I try illegal things, because this is like my time to do what I want to. That is absolutely nowhere in God's Word. God's Word says things like, make a difference for the kingdom of God right now. Go into the world and tell people about Jesus right now. Lay your life down right now. What we want to do, Hudson, is like people lay their lives down for the kingdom of God when they turn 18 or when they turn 21 or when they have a college diploma or when they get married or when they have kids. That's when they get serious about God. It's ridiculous. And you guys have tremendous potential to do things for the kingdom of God. And we are so lazy. Because we're like, is this time to mind? I'm supposed to live life right now. I'm supposed to be rebellious. People are supposed to wait on me. If you're a middle school, you raise your hand. I heard this statement, adults, you want to hear this. The middle school years are the most selfish years of our lives. Sorry, middle schoolers. Sorry, Linda. Middle school can be the most selfish years of your life because you're just, it's all about me. And that's not what Jesus teaches. We're supposed to listen to. And so I wonder if there's anybody tonight that says, I want my life to matter right now. I'm not talking about down the road somewhere. I'm going to be a missionary when I'm 35 years old. How about it right now? I want my life to matter right now. I want my life to matter in that messed up place in Kentucky where I live, that messed up high school that I talk about all the time. I want my life to matter there. I want my life to matter, Camden, on my college campus this fall. I want my life to matter there. I'm not going down there so everybody will notice me. I'm not going down there to be a big deal. I'm going down there so that I can make a difference for the kingdom of God on that campus. And if that's not where I'm going there, I don't need to go. Tell your mom I said that. You still need to go to class. Let me pray tonight for students, for teenagers who want their lives to matter and who want to look around and see the glory of God in this world and let that change them. And finally, after 13 minutes of setup, let's pray. God, tonight I pray that we would see your glory so clearly revealed. That we would see all the ways that you make yourself known in this world. God, maybe we haven't been on a mountain with Jesus and seen him transfigured and transformed and dazzled white in front of us. But we have seen how he changes people. We know what he's done in our own life. We know how good he's been to us. We know how forgiving he's been to us. God, we see your glory in this created world. We see this your glory in the, in the church, in our youth group, in the, the music, and the worship that we have, and the opportunities that we have to grow spiritually, and the friends that we have. We see your glory. We see your glory in the good people in this world, the people who love us, and the people who pray for us, and the people who make it possible for us to come and be a part of a week like this. And God, tonight I pray there are students in this room, I pray there are middle school students who don't want to be selfish with their life anymore, but they want their life to make a difference for the kingdom. And they want to lay their life down before you and say, God, use my life in whatever way you can. I pray for high school students tonight who are tired of being selfish, who are tired of being rebellious in the, in the eyes of the world, the 
the most rebellious thing we can do, Jesus, is follow you. Because there's not really that many people that are doing that. I pray for some of our high school students who would make a difference in other people's lives, that would speak truth into them and pray for them and encourage them and invite them and share the gospel with them. pray for students in this room that would make a difference in this hurting, lost, dark world. I pray tonight that they would seek someone to, to share that commitment with, to pray for them and over them, that some might put their face down again, right back where they were last night, God, but this time they're saying, hey, I know how much I've been forgiven and I know how much love and gratitude I have for you and now I'm ready to do something with it. That will make your name famous, Jesus.
who's ever said to me, I'm just going to waste my life. I've never met anyone who's ever said that. I'm just going to waste my life. I'm just going to waste it. Never met. Anyone. I don't know if you have, but I never have. But I've met dozens of people who say, you know what? I'm going to make a difference in this world. I want to change this world with the name of Jesus. And as Snipes was just speaking, there's one person that I miss dearly to this day that as even I speak right now, he's making a difference. Many of you know
next Friday. I can't wait to get with my friends and just waste my life. God said, hey, I got a purpose. I got a plan for you. I want you to make a difference in this world. Some of you, weekend after weekend, day after day, some of you are wasting your lives by staying up at night, guys, looking at things that you not you should be looking at. And he wants you to keep wasting your life night after night looking at things you're not supposed to be looking at. And maybe tonight you need to say, man, I'm sick and tired of wasting my life. Let's just call it what it is, looking at porn each and every night.
end by sharing this story that I'll let y'all go to small groups. Because some of y'all are like, you don't know how busy I am, what I'm involved in. It's in my Bible all the time.